everybody, this is Mr. Folly again, and with our last podcast for this unit, 5.4, and the last podcast for this test. So this one should be fairly straightforward. These are the labs um, that you can do with um, gases, so I want to make sure you're prepared for it. And then a couple of different application of gas laws and a couple of books that I've read or I'm reading this summer. Find the molar mass. So if you want to find the molar mass, MAMA equation is PV equals mass RT over molar mass. And here's the setup for this. You've got a base with a ring stand on it, wire ring, and Bunsen burner, fire. Um, get yourself a beaker with water in it, and a flask. with uh, aluminum foil on top, okay? Um, and this is the basic setup for the whole thing. So put a few drops into a flask. So a few drops are going to go into the flask. Now this is going to be a volatile liquid. Volatile means that it easily turns into a gas from the French word volaire, which means to steal or to fly. So it flies away easily. It does not mean it burns. It means it turns into a gas quickly. Um, an aluminum foil cap. So it has a pinhole in the top. So if I put a little hole in the top, um, why? And the things that you need, um, the other things that you need are a thermometer, a barometer, and a balance. Do you need the thermometer? Well, first of all, the reason why you have a hole in the top is because you want the pressure on the inside to equal the pressure on the outside, so the barometer tells us the pressure of both if there's a hole inside. Otherwise, the pressures will be different. The reason why you need a thermometer is because we assume that the gas is in what's called thermal equilibrium, with the water. And since you're boiling the water, you boil the water for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. Um, that way it's safe to assume that the temperature of the gas inside the flask is the same as the temperature of the boiling water. So you start out with a couple of drops um, inside. And because it's volatile, if you heat it to 100 degrees Celsius, it's going to turn into a gas. And some of it's going to come out of the top. It doesn't really matter how much you put in there to begin with, because the next thing that you do is you remove the flask from the water, you dry off the outside of the flask, and you let it cool down to room temperature. And what's going to happen is some the gas particles that are left are going to condense. So you're going to take the mass of the empty of the empty flask, and then the mass after heating and drying. Notice we don't really care how much gas or how many drops of liquid we put into the flask to begin with because all of the extra stuff is going to evaporate away because when it evaporates it's going to create a higher pressure inside and keep shooting out the top through the little pinhole until the pressure is equalized. Then once you cool it down because it's cooler it's going to the higher pressure outside is going to flow back inside, and some of the particles will recondense. So it has a pinhole in the top. The pressure flows from high to low. So the pinhole allows you to equalize pressure. So let's see what I have in the next slide. So what is the temperature? The temperature is the temperature of boiling water. How do I know the pressure from the barometer in the room? Because the barometer the pressure inside equals the pressure outside. What is the mass of the gas? Final mass, which will be drops, like two or three drops, um, minus flask. So if I use a 225 milliliter flask, is the volume 225? No. To get the volume of the flask, you fill the flask to the brim. and dump into graduated cylinders. And the reason why is if you have your little flask 
And for the mark right here, it says 225. Really, we've got all this area right here that also must be accounted for. So you've got to make sure that you measure that by filling it to the top and then dumping it into graduate cylinders. So again, you, we know that if it's PV equals mass um, RT over molar mass, again, pressure is atmospheric, volume is adding water and dumping it, mass is the couple of drops that remain, R is duh, temperature is boiling water, and then molar mass can be calculated. Um, yeah. The other lab we kind of looked at before, finding the molar mass by water displacement. Um, you can have an unknown gas, you can pump gas into it, and you start off with an evacuated, um, it can either be an inverted to graduated cylinder or what it, what the real thing you should use is called a udiometer. And they probably will call it an inverted graduated cylinder because most people don't know what udiometers are. But you pump some gas into it and then it's going to, if you start off with an evacuated cylinder, this is the water is going to be rising up into it. And as you put more gas in it, it will push it down. Um, the temperature is, again, is the thermal equilibrium. So that's going to be the temperature of the water and the room. The volume is from the udiometer, but you must equalize levels. That tricks one must equalize levels because that means the pressure in equals pressure out if the water, water levels are the same. Don't forget to subtract water's pressure, Dalton's law. Uh, measurements versus calculations. Remember, a measurement includes subtraction. So, um, yeah, that's, about, that's about it. So, those are the cheesy little labs that they have us do. And unless you call a bold problem a lab. Here's kind of the fun stuff we have left over. So, the book I'm currently reading is The Great Bridge, which is the building of the Brooklyn Bridge. I know, how nerdy am I? Um, and somebody bought it for me. I'm surprised I'm reading it. It's way too many pages long. Um, but to build a bridge like this one, maybe you can't see it, but The Great Bridge is the name of it. This is just a picture from Amazon. You must sink a foundation. Um, and this was built in about the 1870s. So they sank what is like a big house. Now, the big house really is like a really big house. So they sink this in the ground. So you've got, you know, this river. And way down below, you've got the floor. And then you've got this house that they actually floated out here. And then it would sink down. And they'd put little dudes in here digging. So they're digging and they're putting them. They've got these little outlet vent things, which didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And then they have these column things, and then the people would go from this high pressure through it. They'd climb up circular stairs to a pressured thing up on top. And then they'd get out and get on a little ferry and go home. Um, so there's a huge change in pressure when you're 160 feet below um, the water level. So this was the setup for it. So you've got a big house that you'd sink, and then a little stairway thing, and then a pressure lock that would go through it. You had to pressurize the air in there. If you didn't, water would come flowing in the bottom because there's a lot of pressure and all this water. So you have to have a pump that will pump the air into it. So this was a situation that had only been done a time or two before. St. Louis was doing something at the same time. And people would get, when they came out, got what they called Kaisan sickness. The house they sank was called a Kaisan. I think it's Kaisan. Um, guys go from pressure to air, and they'd get pains and be bent over. So they actually originally called it, just to show you a bit of the history, this first uh, happened in St. Louis. It was the first time, well, it wasn't the first time. It was actually designed in France, but Kaisan sickness was described in St. Louis, and they had... Um, workers there that they would call these the Grecian bends because all the workers there were Greek that they'd send down on the bottom. And they would be bent over in pain. Why? Well, your blood, blood is red, dissolves air in it. Now, typically that air is, we think of that air being oxygen. And there is oxygen in there. Okay, oxygen. And your blood is able to deliver oxygen to wherever it goes. You also have some other particles that uh, appear in there too. You've got some carbon dioxide, not a whole lot. And then you've got some nitrogen. 
Now what would happen is, if you go from high pressure, high pressure means lots of gas dissolves. And this would be in the bottom of the river. Um, when you come up to the top, you have, relatively speaking, low pressure, so the gas would effervesce. Uh, I'll just scribble because I can't spell effervesce. I think it's S-C-E, yeah. Um, effervesce. And that means you would get bubbles in your bloodstream, which would block um, blood flow. So if you get a big honking bubble, it's going to block blood flow. And typically it happened in the extremities. So you'd have these blockages. You'd lose feeling in your fingers for a while. And after a while, your body would right itself, ideally. But it can be horribly painful, and it can cause death. If it blocks blood to an important spot, then that part of the body dies. And if it's important enough, the person dies. So that was an unexpected thing. You'd think you can just go down to the bottom of the river, um, dig out the bottom of the river, put on this foundation, and go. But the pressure really caused that, and they didn't know why. So it's really kind of interesting. They just know these people would go down into these giant, basic caves. Um, this is the one where I was talking about limelight before. Lit by limelight, they'd come up, and they'd basically fall down in pain. And, ah, uh, they can't take it, they can't take it. And eventually they realized that the way they should do it is to slowly ascend. Um, and slowly means, like, what was it, like 20 minutes for every... Um, change in pounds per square foot or whatever it was. So it would take like, I think it was like two and a half hours for them to go the 160 feet. And they didn't want to pay those people and they figured. Um, and the people didn't want to do it either. They didn't want to wait two and a half hours because in Brooklyn they said that uh, basically if you're in there for four hours, it was a four hour shift, um, they wanted to um, get out and you know relax and see the sunshine. Their voices were soft and low. If you have high pressure, that means the density of the air is very high. So why do their voices sound much quieter? Well, if you have a lot more air, when you're trying to speak, when you're trying to push the air out when you speak, then if it's dense air, it will move more slowly. And if it moves more slowly, that means it would be a weaker sound or a softer sound. The reason why it would be lower is in your vocal cords shake when you speak, right? So if the air is dense, they're going to shake more slowly. If they shake more slowly, that means that the vibration will be lower. So you're going to sound more like a man, but you're going to whisper like a little girl. So weird things that gases do. I just thought this was the interesting part of it. Um, what I read over the summer was um, a book by Alex Kershaw called Escape from the Deep. Um, and it was about a submarine that was a great killer of uh, enemy subs, so it would fly, um, sneak over there, killed, I don't know, it was like six on this last mission. And the last torpedo they were going to shoot before they went back to Pearl Harbor turned around and hit the submarine itself, which was bad. So then they sank in something like 180 feet of water, which is strange because I think that was roughly the depth of um, the Brooklyn Bridge Kaisan as well. Um, to get out, they must get from pressurized air, which is in the submarine, um, to the water, to the surface. Yikes. 180 feet is a long, 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 long way. So what they had to do is there was an escape hatch. You've got your little submarine here. Escape hatch, you've got dudes. Um, and they would have to climb in here and slowly let the water in. So imagine this. You're a dude standing here. You're letting the water in, and you are in 180 feet of water. Ah! And they would keep letting it in, and the air that's left... So if I've got, you know, say, I'm going to go all chemistry on you, 10 moles of air, and I keep letting water in, the 10 moles of air aren't going to change. The water, it's just going to make it more and more pressurized until the air pushes the water down to where you've got the right amount of air. And then they'd have this little buoy thing with a rope on it. They'd go and shoot up to the top and it would have knots every 10 feet. 
So as this pressure was increasing, so it's an uh, unbelievable pressure, the people's ears were bursting though, because the pressure was so much. You know, you chew gum, try and get rid of it. I guess that wasn't enough. They were bleeding out of their ears. You have to do this in pitch black. The power was out in the sub. The sub was sunk. Part of it was flooded. Ah. So then what they would have to do was go from, I guess this is my next line. Well, going up, they need to stop every feet, f five feet and count to ten to exhale or their lungs will explode. Now, notice we're not talking too much about inhaling. We're talking about exhaling. Be so remember, your pressure, your lungs and your pressure, say you've got ten moles in your lungs. I know ten moles is not really right. Um, and the pressure outside is very high. And the pressure inside would be very low. Okay? Or let's just say the pressure outside is 100 and inside is uh, 20. Okay? Now, as you move up to this spot, you still have 10 moles. The pressure outside now is 5. And the pressure inside is 20. You're getting closer to the surface. Um, if that happens, what happens to the volume of your lungs? Your lungs are flexible. Your lungs would expand. Or they would explode. So imagine in the pitch dark, you're climbing up a rope from 180 feet of water, and you have to make sure you exhale or your lungs will explode. Yikes. The really freaky part was they didn't need oxygen. They would just have to exhale. They didn't have to inhale. The reason why is because the pressure was so great in their lungs, again, 10 moles. Let's just say 10. Again, I made that up. Normally, you'd have 0.5 moles. But the pressure is so great, and your body's used to it because you're down in the submarine. You've got 10 moles. Um, you can exhale a little bit. Let's say every time you stop and exhale, you lose uh, 0.2 moles. Let's say 10 moles of oxygen. You know, you've got other stuff in there, but just say it's 10 moles of oxygen. You exhale 0.2 moles of oxygen. That means you can keep exhaling, and you still have oxygen in your lungs from before because typically... The regular, you know, regular Mr. Folly here, my lungs have just 0.05 moles. So if you increase the pressure, you increase the moles of gas in there. So you've increased the moles of oxygen in there. So you don't need an outside source of oxygen. You have your own little oxygen tank. And that gave them something like 10 minutes. <sighs> Could you imagine being able to hold your breath for 10 minutes? That's just freaking. In the pitch black, climbing up a rope, thinking you're going to die and having to wait and stop on a knotted rope and wait and exhale and count to 20 every time. Wow. Which is why submarines can be scary. In review, love your veterans. Uh, pressure equalizes given the chance by going from high to low. And it can go from high to low or changing volume as with the lungs. Dalton's law of partial pressure is always used when collecting gas over water. So when I was talking um, way back here, give my submarine thing, my submarine picture where I talked about the water and the pressure of the air. So I had water coming in, increasing the pressure of the air. I also had to add plus the pressure of H2O. I should have included Dalton's law of partial pressure for that part. So sorry, I forgot that. Uh, when collecting gas over water, like if you're equalizing the pressure to climb out of a submarine. Pressure can also be increased by being underwater and cause weird effects in the moles of gas and volume shift. So, in other words, you've got extra air. Volume shifts, your lungs might explode. Um, the opposite is true of fighter pilots. Fighter pilots are up higher where the pressure is lower, or regular pilots for that matter. Um, when the pressure is lower, so they need an outside source of ox oxygen because they need to increase the pressure, increase the moles of gas needed to keep you conscious. Real life must fight these issues as well. If you want to make macaroni and cheese on a mountain, so here's my little, here's my general definition of pressure. Pressure is a column of air beating down on your head. So if you're on top of a mountain, the column of air beating down on your head is much less than the column of air beating down your head on the ground. I am. Okay, so if I'm up here, there's less pressure because there's less air beating down on my head. Okay, so if you're boiling water or something like that, um, if, when you make macaroni and cheese, you need to boil water. Um, the effect of pressure beating down on the macaroni and cheese, greater pressure would keep water, not macaroni and cheese, a liquid for longer. So up here, 
the pressure is less, so it's going to boil at a lower temperature. And basically, when you cook pasta by putting it in boiling water, your oven is the boiling water. So if you cook water right here where we live, you're cooking it in an oven of 100 degrees Celsius. If you cook pasta on the top of a mountain or in Colorado or something like that, um, water boils at like 88 degrees Celsius. So if you're cooking at a lower temperature, you need to cook it your food longer. And that is about it. So what a wonderful little podcast. I'm sorry it went a little long, but I hope you enjoyed my little stories and give you some different ways to think of gas laws. Have a good one, and I'll see you in class tomorrow. Bye.